Hi class. So today I'm going to read Growing Up Asian in America by Kasaya Noda. This is our second text of the unit. Um, as you are following along, you should have your own packet uh, with all of this printed out. Uh, make sure you are annotating. So underline details that indicate the author's feelings about her Japanese heritage. Draw a, do a dotted line under um, details that vividly indicate the author's feelings about her American reality. And then of course, always circle any unknown words or phrases that we can get back to later. Um, try to determine the meaning of words using context clues, uh, word parts, dictionary, or just ask me after this is over. Okay. And as I am reading, you are listening with a pen in hand and you're just taking other, any other little notes, maybe drawing doodles, um, to help you remember. Okay, so Kisaya Noda uh, grew up in New Hampshire as a grandchild of Japanese immigrants. She experienced the culture of the United States as well as the Japanese culture of her grandparents. In her essay, she talks about how both cultures have influenced her character. So right away, I see that both is bolded. So this is going to make uh, be a big deal. I might circle it and put like dual identity or double identity. Um, she with her Japanese side and also her American side. So Growing Up Asian in America by Kisaya Inoda. I am racially Japanese. Sometimes when I was growing up, my identity seemed to hurtle toward me and paste itself right to my face. I felt that way encountering the stereotypes of my race perpetuated by non-Japanese people, primarily white, who may or may not have had contact with other Japanese in America. You don't like cheese, do you? Someone would ask. I know your people don't like cheese. Sometimes questions came making allusions to history. That was another aspect of the identity. Events that had happened quite apart from the me who stood silent in that moment connected my face with an incomprehensible past. Your parents were in California? Were they in those camps during the war? And sometimes there were phrases or nicknames, Lotus Blossom. I was sometimes addressed or referred to as racially Japanese, sometimes as Japanese American, and sometimes as an Asian woman. Confusions and distortions abounded. So right here, I would talk about how she is telling us her identity, um, how people viewed her and how she also stayed silent and how these ideas were wrong. And they came from people that are not Japanese and they just assumed things about her and blurted out these questions um, that seem rude, very rude, right? So let's continue, especially calling her names too. How is one to know and define oneself? From the inside, within a context that is self-defined from a grounding in community and a connection with culture and history that are comfortably accepted, or from the outside, in terms of messages received from the media and people who are often ignorant. Even as an adult, I can still see two sides of my face and past. I can see from the out, inside out in freedom, and I can see from the outside in driven by the old voices of childhood and lost in anger and fear. I'm racially Japanese. So as a child, she received a lot of these outside messages and those outside messages were not pleasant and they were also downright racist. Okay. A voice from my childhood says, you are other, you are less than, you are unalterably alien. This voice has its own history we have indeed been seen as other and alien since the early years of our arrival in the United States. The very first immigrants were welcomed and sought as laborers to replace the dwindling numbers of Chinese whose influx had been cut off by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Japanese fell natural heir to the same anti-Asian prejudice that had arisen against the Chinese. As soon as they began striking for better wages, they were no longer welcomed. Right here, I would just write something like, what, I would question the text, what rights do immigrants have? If they're here and they're working, 
are they allowed any rights? Should they be treated um, with respect? Should they be treated like we would treat anybody else who works? Um, do those rights apply to them? Uh, and hopefully the answer is like, absolutely yes. Uh, but we see that that's not happening. I can see myself today as a person historically defined by law and custom as being forever alien, being neither free white nor African. Our people in California were deemed aliens, ineligible for citizenship. No matter how long they intended to stay here, aliens ineligible for citizenship were prohibited from owning, buying, or leasing land. They did not and could not belong here. The voice in me remembers that I am always a Japanese American in the eyes of many. A third generation German American is an American. A third generation Japanese American is a Japanese American. Being Japanese means being a danger to the country during the war and knowing how to use chopsticks. I wear this history on my face. Um, I wear this history on my face. What do you think that means? If you were to see her, would you know, oh, okay, will we just call you American or would you associate her face and her features with Asian American or Japanese American? And it, how many generations does one have to be here to just be seen as American, whether they want to or not? I move to the other side. I see a different light and, a claim a, and claim a different context. My race is a line that stretches across the ocean in time to link me to the shrine where my grandmother was raised. Two high white banners lift in the wind at the top of the stone steps leading to the shrine. It is time for the summer festival. Black characters are written against the sky as boldly as the clouds, as lightly as kites, as sharply as the big black crows. I used to see I used to see above the fields in New Hampshire. At festival time, there's a liquor and food, ritual, discipline, and abandonment. There is music and drunkenness and invocation. There's hope. Another season has come. Another season has gone. So now she's going to the inside, right? Remember she says the outside forces of her identity and how she perceives herself and also that inside um, and identifying yourself by your own culture and your roots and who you are in your community. So that's where we see it, what we see in five. I'm racially Japanese. I have a certain claim to this crazy place where the prayers intoned by a neighboring Shinto priest standing in front in for my grandmother's nephew who is sick, are drowned out by the rehearsals of the pop singing contest in which most of the villagers will compete later that night. The village elders, the priests, and I stand respectfully upon the immaculate shining wooden floors of the outer shrine, borrowing our bowing our heads before the hidden powers. During the patchy intervals when I can hear him, I notice the priest has a stutter. His voice flutters up to my ears only occasionally because two men and a woman are singing gustly into a microphone in the compound, testing the sound system. A pre-recorded tape of guitars, samsons, drums accompanies them. Rock music and Shinto prayers. That night, so right here, there's another duality there, right? There's two uncommon things next to each other um, that become whole. So there's a juxtaposition, but that makes up one um, piece of evidence, one scenario, one identity. That night to loud applauses and cheers, a young man is given the award for the most Netsuchusu, passionate burning rendition of the song. We roar our approval of the reward. Never mind that his voice had wandered and slid, now slightly above, now slightly below the given line of the melody. Netsurutsu, Netsurutsu. And that means passion, passionate. In the morning, my grandmother's sister kneels at the foot of the stairs of the stone stairs to offer her morning prayers. She's too crippled to climb the stairs, so each morning she kneels here upon the path. She shuts her eyes for a few seconds. Her motions, as a matter of fact, is when she washes her washes rice. I linger longer than she does, so reluctant to leave, savoring the connection I feel with my grandmother in America, the past, and the power that lives and shines in the morning sun. 
Our family has served this shrine for generations. The family's need to protect this claim to identity and place outweighs any individual claim to any individual hope. I am Japanese. So here we see uh, she's defining herself as this rich culture um, with traditions and she feels really close to her grandma and she wants to feel really close to her grandma um, even though this is happening in the U.S., right? Even though she's growing up in the U.S., this is a really big part of her identity. So that's the inside out and what she had mentioned is freedom before. I am a Japanese American. Weak, I hear the voice from my childhood ears. Passive, I hear. Our parents and grandparents were the ones who put, who were put into those camps. They went without resistance. They offered cooperation as proof of loyalty to America. Victim, I hear, and silent. Uh, definitely pay attention to those words and quotations. This is what she is hearing from when we put uh, Japanese people into internment camps. And she said, right, they offered cooperation as proof of loyalty, like, hey, we are American. Um, but she's still hearing this weak, passive, right? What is she not hearing? She's not hearing standing up, um, fighting back, fighting, you know, for the human rights. And so she's taking this in as well. Our parents are painted as hard workers who were socially uncomfortable and had had difficulty expressing even the smallest opinion. Clean, quiet, motivated, and determined to match the American way. This is us, and that is the story of our time here. Why did you go into those camps? I raged at my parents, frightened by my own inner silence and, tim and timidity. Why didn't you do anything to resist? Why didn't you name it the injustice it was? Couldn't our parents even think? Couldn't they? Why were we so passive? So here she's questioning her own parents. Like, why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they collectively say something? Um, but I also want to go back to cooperation as proof of loyalty to America. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear that immigrants face. A fear of deportation, fear of being sensed as the other, as alien, as being seen less than. So perhaps calming any of those fears is the way to go for some people. Like, I already have this reputation that you put on me. I don't want to make it worse. Um, okay, so moving on. I shift my vision and my stance. I am in California. My uncle is in the midst of the sweet potato harvest. He is pressed, trying to get the harvesting crews onto the field as quickly as possible, worried about the float of equipment and people. His big pickup is pulled off to the side, motor running, door ajar. I see two tractors in the yard in front of an old shed. That flatbed harvesting platform on which the workers will stand has already been brought over from the other field. It's early morning. The workers stand loosely grouped and at ease, but my uncle looks as harried, as tense as a police officer trying to ensnarl a New York City traffic jam. Driving toward the shed, I pull my car off the road and make way for an approaching tractor. The front wheels of the car sink luxuriously into the soft white sand by the roadside and the car slides to a dreamy halt, tail still on the road. I try to move forward. I try to move back. The front bites contentedly into the sand. The back lifts itself at a jaunty angle. My uncle sees me and storms down the road, running. He's shouting before he, before he is even near me. So imagery, imagery, imagery. We have this huge, this entire scene just unfolded right in front of our eyes. Um, you should be able to picture this going on in your mind's eye. What's the matter with you? He screams. What the hell are you doing? In his frenzy, he grabs his hat off his head and slashes it through the air across his knees. He is beside himself. You've blocked the whole roadway. How am I supposed to get my tractors out of here? Can't you use your head? You've cut off the whole roadway and we've got to get out of here. I stand on the road before him, helplessly thinking, no, I don't know how to drive in sand. I've never driven in sand. I'm sorry, uncle, I say, burying a smile beneath a look of a sincere apology. I notice my deep amusement and my affection for him with great curiosity. I'm usually devastated by anger, but not this time. Hmm, 
I'm going to stop there. Why is she not angry that her uncle yelled at her and that he came after her and that he run, he ran and he shouted before she can even hear him. And he's waving his hat in the air and like hitting his knee. Like, why did you do this? What do you, can't you think, right? Why is this bringing her some type of pleasure? Why is she oddly satisfied by this gesture? Um, and the answer is, if you look above, if you look a little bit ahead, when she's talking about this first paragraph nine, I don't think her she would categorize her uncle as this, what we see in paragraph nine and paragraph 10. Okay. Um, moving on. During the several years that follow, I learn about the people and the place and much more about what has happened in this California village where my parents grew up. The Issei, our grandparents, made this settlement in the desert. Their first crops were eaten by rabbits and ravaged by insects. The land was so barren that men walking from house to house sometimes got lost. Women came here too. They bore children in 114 degree heat then carried the babies with them into the fields to nurse when they reached the end of each row of grapes or other or other truck farm crops. Um, I would write something down there as well, right? I mean, definitely what you think of, I mean, initially you may think like hard workers for sure, but then if you think about it a little bit more, I also think, wow, that's, that's so sad. I mean, 114 degree, having babies, having to nurse babies, um, that's pretty, pretty brutal. Okay. I had had no idea, I had no idea what it meant to buy this kind of land and make it grow green, or how when the war came, there was no space at all for the, subtly of, for the subtlety of being who we, are, who we were, Japanese Americans. Either or was the way. I hadn't understood that people were literally afraid for their lives then, that their money had been frozen in banks, that there was a five mile travel limit, that when the early evening curfew came and they were inside their houses, some of them watched helplessly as people they knew went into their barns to steal their belongings. The police were patrolling the road, interested only in violators of curfew. There was no help um, for them in the face of thievery. I had not been able to imagine before what it must have felt like to be an American, to know absolutely that one is an American, and yet to have almost everyone else deny it. Not only deny it, but challenge that identity with machine guns and troops of white American soldiers. In those circumstances, it was difficult to say, I'm a Japanese American. American had to do. So... How come the police were only interested in um, catching the violators of curfew? And so she's mentioning that, I think, to show the differences of the laws being broken. So breaking the law by staying out later than curfew and breaking the law by stealing from someone, from stealing from their homes, stealing their belongings. And she's saying, you know, but they were only interested in the violators of their curfew, not any other type of crime that was being broken here. Um, and then she says here, right? Uh, you cannot say I'm Japanese American, even if you fully are identifying and love this part of who you are and your culture during this time, um, which was during World War II, you can't just, you can't say I'm Japanese American, right? That's less than, that's other, that's the enemy, could be. Um, you just have to say American, even though you were on your face, that you're also Japanese American. Okay, almost done here. But now I can say that I am Japanese American. It means I have a place here in this country too. I have a place here on the East Coast where our neighbor is so much a part of our family that my mother never passes her house at night without glancing at the lights to see if she's home and safe, where my parents have hauled hundreds of pounds of rocks from fields and arduously planted Christmas trees and blueberries, lilacs, asparagus, and crab apples, where my father still dreams of angling a stream to a new bed so that he can dig a pond in the field and fill it with water and fish. The neighbors already came for their Christmas tree, he, uh, he asked. 
in December. Do they like it? Did they like it? I have a place on the West Coast where my relatives still farm, where I heard the stories of feuds and backbiting, where I saw the people survived and flourished because fundamentally they trusted and relied upon one another. A death in the family is not just a death in the family. It is a death in the community. I saw people help each other with money, materials, labor, attention, and time. I saw men gather once a year without fail to clean the grounds of a 90-year-old woman who had helped the community before, during, and after the war. I saw her remembering them with birthday cards sent to each of their children. I come from a people with a long memory and, distinct, and a distinctive grace. We live our things, and we are Americans, Japanese Americans. Okay. Okay. That is the end of her essay. Um, and finally, she identifies herself as Japanese American, not just American. Um, so she includes the Japanese part because she does fully embrace this side regardless of what um, she has been told about it, regardless of that outside information, she has learned to embrace the site from the inside out, from her community, which she describes as a beautiful community, helping each other, being there for each other, right? H giving each other supplies and need. Um, and also with her American side, right? She is part of the East Coast of the U.S. and she's part of the West Coast of the U.S. She's very much American as she was born here and grew up with American culture. So for me, I would say I, you know, anybody who is, has a dual identity, um, you're Mexican-American, you're Chicana, you're uh, Salvadorian-American, you're Guatemalan-American, then you deal with the fact of like, I go to school here, my community's here, I'm speaking English here, but then... I'm also speaking another language and I also have these rich type foods and these traditions. And so it is fully being right 100% of each culture. Um, so that's our reading. I hope this helped and I'll see you in class for the TDQs.